Now you can hear me, right? He loves you. He loves you. He is risen. He came back because there is no greater love. Amen. Mr. Mugo, thank you for being here. Where are you? Over here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the greetings from Madam Ambassador Jean Kamau. Pastor Karaoke, thank you so much for last night. Uh, Lori and I were invited to be with the ambassador, former prime minister of Kenya, and Pastor Karaoke as uh, guests, and many Kenyans, marathon runners, oh my gosh, those guys are big. So when I was in Kenya, I took the mat matatu, you know, Mr. Mugo, the matatu, I took that. About 20 kilometers into Nairobi, and I'm, so it's like a bus, right? And the Kenyans are passing me running. They run everywhere. And we are so blessed to be in community with them. And the water well, there's so many good things happening in that relationship. And it's a combination of church, nonprofit, business, all coming together. And he mentioned Kenyon University. That's because our own Steve Todd, who's uh, a member of uh, Liberty Church, is with EMC. And there's this uh, wonderful collaboration of EMC with Kenya and Kenyon University. And Liberty Church is involved. And the dreams are, it's just a wonderful coming together of parties to help people, to educate people, to give water to people in Kenya and the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Well, we have uh, the National Day of Prayer coming up. So this next week, there's nothing. The week after, the week after this week, City Life on Tuesday night, on Wednesday night in Shrewsbury, National Day of Prayer. You're welcome to come and join us. 6 o'clock for dinner, 7 o'clock, a one-hour prayer service. We offer the U.S., we offer our leaders, we offer the world governments to God in prayer. That's a week from this Wednesday in Shrewsbury. You're welcome to come. Now, some of you are looking around right now and going, where are the Christmas decorations? Welcome back. We're glad to have you here on Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection. And... You know, um, my sermon for today is really important. It's a really important word for all of us to hear. And it's about this incredible love of God. And the title of the sermon is The Invitation. Now, I want you to guess, where does this come from? I'm going to read something right now. Think in your mind, where does this come from? Listen to these words. Listen, my beloved. Look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind the wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke to me and said, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruits, the blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. Where does that come from? Very good. The Bible. <laughs> this is pretty racing love poetry, isn't it? Some of the passages, well, this comes specifically, I heard over here, from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. That's what I read. Try reading this whole book. It's right in the middle of your Bibles. And let me say, some of it is really kind of rated R. This is love poetry. Why is it in the Bible? It's in the Old Testament, so Israel put it there first, and then... The Christian church said, we want it there too. 
we want that in our Bible too. This is an important book. Did you know God is not mentioned in the Song of Solomon? Nowhere. Why is it in the Bible? Love poetry. It's because the church has always said, this is God's love for us. And our love returned to God. This is a love that describes the love relationship of God to the people of God. And that's why it's in the Bible. Now tell me if you don't agree with this. Listen to this. Ready? All the world seeks intimacy. Do you believe that? Yeah. Tell me if you don't agree with this too. Inside of you, there is in me, inside of you is a place that longs to be connected to another. We long for intimacy. We want to share our life with another. We want to be intimate with another. That word intimate can mean a lot of things, not always physical, sometimes physical, but can mean just sharing your life with someone you love, just pouring your life into someone you care about. There's a place inside all of us that hungers for that, that longs for that, that wants to be in a relationship of trust. There's a professor at Towson University, his name is Andrew Reiner, and this is what he says. He said that, you know, social media, like Facebook and dating sites, Match.com, Harmony, all those things, they were supposed to bring us together. They were supposed to create community and bring us close in relationship with each other. And I think to some degree it's true. For example, you know, in Facebook, I don't know if you use it, but you can create circles. You can create people where only they see some things you put on. So I have my children, my wife, my father, people I'm really close to, some best friends, in one of those circles. And that's, I share pictures every day. I show my dad when I'm eating for breakfast. Look at this, Dad, because he's so proud of the breakfast he makes. I just put on their things for my kids. I'm in constant communication with my children. I love social media for that purpose. I love the connection I have with those God has given me to say, I want you to love on these people. I like them. But you know, Townsend goes on to say that for a lot of people, maybe even most, Facebook and similar social media creates isolation. That instead, we become socially competitive. Here I am in the Bahamas. Sorry, you're up there in the snow. How many likes do you have on your page? Right? There are lots of ways in which we have created a situation with social media that actually pulls us further apart creates envy and jealousy. And we're not closer, we're further apart. And then there's the dating sites. You know those profiles? Do you believe them? Those pictures are 20 years old. <laughs> Some of those, if you read them, are like perfect people. Oh my gosh, right? Is that really true? Townsend says, we put, we work on our profiles on Facebook. We obsess about to make sure that we're putting forth the right look. And it isn't true. Another person who studies these things, Sharon Etheridge, this, she's a Christian counselor. This is what she said. She said, um, the book Fifty Shades of Grey <laughs> has sold 40 million copies. She said that there's a hotel in Europe that took out all their Gideon Bibles and put in 50 Shades of Grey. And that book and other books like it, you know what it's about? It's about people on a search for intimacy. It's just people looking for fulfillment 
It's people looking to be connected, trying to fill this place inside of them. And people try all kinds of things to do that. I mean, isn't that really what pornography is? Trying to, trying to get connected, trying to fill that place. Isn't that what affairs or one night stands? Isn't that what that's about? Trying to connect with someone in an intimate way, physically, and maybe it'll transfer to spiritual connection. But it's going the wrong way, isn't it? Because it just leaves us worse. Billy Graham was speaking to a group of young men and women on this very thing. And he said, you know, some of you I know go out Saturday night and you sow wild oats. And then on Sunday you pray for crop failure. You know, he was saying something similar. Just, you put the cart before the horse. We're trying so hard to meet that need inside of us. And we do it in all the wrong ways. And it doesn't work. We're on a search for intimacy because we were created to be in a life-sharing relationship with God. That's who put that place within us. That we might hunger for the Lord, first and foremost. I'm going to get back to how that works with other people, but for now, God put that place inside of us that we might hunger for the Lord. From Genesis to Revelation, this is really true, the Bible is a love letter to you, not just the book of Sol Solomon. It's God saying, I want you, I want to be in your life, I want to fill you up with love, I want to know you, I want to share life with you. I want to give you life with a capital L. I want your life back. This is what God wants, and it's all over Scripture. Look at it, the book of Revelation. What is God, I mean, book of Genesis, right at the very beginning of the Bible, chapter 1. What is God trying to do? What is He doing there? He's nesting. He's creating this beautiful place, right? Nesting refers to what we see new parents doing when, you know, someone gets pregnant for the very first time, and what does she do? She wants to create a place for the baby, right? It might just be a corner in the bedroom, in the apartment, someplace. Put Noah's Ark animals on the wall, a little crib, a little mobile over the crib, maybe. You know, expectant mothers, they nest, right? They create a place. <laughs> I was reading uh, a magazine called Modern Mom. I don't know why I was reading Modern Mom, but I just thought I would read Modern Mom. And it was an article for people who wanted to have a baby. And they said, well, you have to pass a number of tests before. The first one was, go buy a beanbag chair, tie it around your neck, and walk around all day with this thing. Get in and out of the car, go to the grocery store, cook a meal with this big bag chip. Okay, that was for expectant mothers. Another one was the mess test. So the author said, take your hands, put them in flower pots, get them really dirty, then stick them in a jar of peanut butter, and then pour ketchup on, and then smear it all over the kitchen. Can you tolerate that? No, man, that you're preparing for a baby. My favorite one, though, is the final test, which was this. Call over all your, your mother friends who already have children. Have them in your living room and tell them how to be a mother. This is how you raise your kids. This is what they do if they get out of hand. This is how you discipline your kids. This is what you do if they run in the street. This is what you do if they badmouth you. This is how the kind of school you should find. You should do this because this will be the last time you ever have all the answers. <laughs> That's nesting. It's preparing. God nested in Genesis 1. God created this incredible place. God created a garden of Eden. It was absolutely beautiful and stunning. 
There was food everywhere. It was stunningly beautiful. And then God created man with a remote. No, do that. God created man. Right? Created man out of love. And this is what God said in Genesis 2. It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper, a companion. God realized that there's this place God created inside us that needs to be connected to God, connected to one another, because we hunger for intimacy. And you've got to get a picture of how this very first community worked. Adam and Eve and God in the garden. They were really close. Sharing life, sharing love, being intimate with each other, you could say. Just being together. It says here in Genesis chapter 3, When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze. Stop right there, everyone. I love that. I love that. This picture of God strolling through his park that he made, right, in the evening breeze. And he's on his way to fellowship with his human creatures. I mean, there's this beautiful picture, isn't it? Like, every day God is out there strolling in the park, and they all get together and have a picnic. I mean, this could be a dating site profile. Almighty God loves to stroll in the park in the evening breeze. Only this would be true. It's just a beautiful picture of love, right? Of life shown. So there he is, strolling in the evening breeze. The man and wife hid in the trees of the garden. They hid from God. Why? Because they broke the trust. That is really painful, isn't it? You ever been there? You love somebody and the trust is broken? The reason why it's so painful is because it's a love relationship. It hurts really bad. And it's really hard to heal. It takes time. You can do it. It takes time. For God, it's taken most of human history. Because after that happened, you know what God did? God set out on an incredible journey, an incredible adventure to win us back. God set out to just love us back. And the rest of Genesis, all the way down to the cross and resurrection of Jesus, and continuing on today, is God in pursuit of you, out of love, to repair the breach and bring you back home, love on you again, and you to love back on Him. We have this hunger for God. And God wants to fill it. What can we do? God's already done all the work. When God hung on the cross, do you know why he did that? It was out of love. I love the song that goes, if nails didn't hold him there, love would. Mm. And from that cross, he loved you and me. From that cross, he forgave us. From the cross, he was redeeming us and bringing us back to himself. And the empty tomb is the evidence that this God loves today and desires to be in your heart now as the living Lord, blessing you, giving you life, filling that place that longs for connection and intimacy. This is about knowing God. In Hebrew, there's a word that means to know, as in to know another person. And that Hebrew word is yada. But it has all these different layers of meaning. So one layer is, you know, you meet somebody, you get to know them, that's yada. 
Another one is you have a really, really close friend. You know, the kind you go to coffee with, you really share who you are and so on. That's also to know someone, yara. But here's another, here's another definition for that same word. Adam do Eve, yara Eve, and she had a baby. So you, have you ever heard that phrase, he knew her in a biblical way? And it means they had sex, right? That also is in that word to know. So you really have to know the context to get the meaning. Or you could really be mistaken. It was, when I was learning Hebrew, we had to come up with mental tools to remember things, you know? So yada, we just thought of it as, ta-da! <laughs> so if you yada, ta-da, you have a baby. <laughs> so here's the funny thing. This word is used in the Bible to mean God wants to know us. What does that mean? But God wants to share life with us. God wants to be connected to us in a really close way. And God desires that we know God back. Now here's a really cool thing. Here's a really, really, really cool thing. I want you to really get this part. When you get to know God, it enables you to get to know those closest to you in a deeper way. Amen. Listen. You aren't ready to be in a love relationship with man, woman, or good friend, even, right? Because not all close relationships are sexual. We can be really close to someone and it's not a sexual thing, right? Really good friends. You aren't ready to really know another person that God gives you to know. Your children, your parents, close friends, without knowing God. You've got to know God. And what happens when you know God is you are filled with the presence of God that enables you then to love in a way you've never loved before. It's really true. Because when you get to know God, you get to know a God who is patient and long-suffering, who chased after you throughout all of history to find you, who poured out his life for you. And when you get to know a God like that, you know what it does? It begins to touch you and change you in a way that you become more of a lover. Lover of people. Now, I'm a guy. You know, guys, guys kind of struggle sometimes with intimacy. Like when, when guys talk to each other, it's usually facing the TV with a bowl of buffalo wings between us, right? Have you ever seen how women talk to each other? Women get knee to knee and they go, oh really? What happened there? Oh God, I really have, oh no, he didn't, oh! Right? That's all women talk. Guys are, yeah, how you doing? Nathan of Celtics, huh? <laughs> Let me just say, I've had to work at this. I've had to work at intimacy. And I've made mistakes with intimacy. So I'm going to tell you something right now, and it's not a boast, and it's, it's not, I'm not putting myself on a pedestal. Please don't. I just want to share with you my, part of my life that is just so cool and it comes from God, not me. It comes from God and you can know the same thing too. It's testimony. Just, just hear this. Along with my prayer life, there is an experience I have nearly every day that is the most wonderful experience in my life. Something happens every day that I adore. Do you want to know what it is? My wife Lori and I live in a little split level house. It's between here and Los Angeles. It's in a town called Lester. 
No, Rick, you, you live further away, don't you? You're in like one of those Brookfields. He lives near the Mojave Desert. <laughs> this is what I adore. I want you to I adore coming home and opening up the door, walking up the little flight of stairs. My wife, Lori, is there. She hugs me. She gives me a kiss. And you know what we do? We sit down. We unpack our lives. It's usually 30 minutes. Sometimes it's 60. Sometimes it's all evening because we have a lot to say sometimes. There is no time in my life, it's kind of like prayer, because I love prayer. There is no time in my life better than that. You know what we call that time? Love making. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you. That's what we call it. Love making. As we sit and talk about our lives. You see, I couldn't do that. Not like I do now. God has made that possible in my life. Do you want a closer relationship to those few God gives you to be really close to? Do you want that? Get close to God. Because the love of God enables you to begin to be better. It's what God has done in my life. It's what God can do in yours, too. Make you a better lover. I might just be a good friend. That's it. Okay. Closeness, connection, sharing. You know, and it always has to do with food. You know what I mean? So my wife wakes up in the morning going, you know what I'm going to do tonight with garlic? She starts talking about dinner. I said, honey, I can't believe you. First thing in the morning, she's thinking of dinner. Throughout the day, she's texting me. I'm going to roast potatoes today. We have the family meal, and her boys cannot get up from the table without kissing her. She's Italian. That explains it, right? Mind, mind. Yep. But I'm making a point. Of it. And that is that part of sharing often includes meals. And you know what? What's amazing is God, God agrees. Because, in fact, I think God made that. Because it's from Genesis to Revelation 2 that God has always wanted us to eat with God. And God provides the meal. Again, in the park. You know what they were doing in Genesis 1? Picnicking! God made all this food. Sharing a meal. In the evening breeze. And then it keeps going. There's the Passover meal. There's the water and the men and the quail God provides in the wilderness. I could keep going on and on and on about meals and God. What about the most intimate scene in the whole Bible? Jesus with 12 men that he poured his life into for three years. In love. And then they're in the Last Supper. Take eat. So I'm pining. Take eat. Drink. This is the cup. It's over a meal. He's sharing life. There's the road to man. Road to man. I got to tell you this one. So, you know, the Gospel of Matthew ends with the risen Lord, the resurrected Lord going, Go ye into the world, make a disciple. Right? But in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, what does the risen Lord say that's so profound, so important? He's got to get the words out. He's risen from the dead. He's about to go home to the Father. What does he say? his disciples, come and have breakfast. Come and have breakfast. Look it up, chapter 21, verse 12. In other words, eat, share life with me. Look it. You thought it was just about rules. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. All right, the rules are important. We know we break them. It hurts us, right? But that's not the first thing God's thinking about. Look at it. When you were raising young children, what do you say? Don't run in the street. Don't touch the hot stove. Get away from that. Sit up. Don't put your elbows on the... Right? 
But what do you do when they're older, kids? Some of you are thinking, I don't need to go to church because I'm a good person. Congratulations. You're following the rules, I guess, or thereabouts, right? So you don't need to come to church every Sunday. Is what you're thinking. But you know what God? You know what God wants? The same thing I want. My children are young adults. I don't listen out of my mouth when I talk to them. It's not, are you sitting up straight? I want to know them. I want to know what's going on in their lives. Who the heartthrobs are. What they're passionate about. What they love. What they hate. How's it going with their boss? I want them to know me as their father. That's what I want now. I don't go, did you run out in the street? With my 25 year old? Like 